Advent is a time to prepare. Something big is coming, or someone. I know you know the big one is Jesus. You, you knew that. You saw it coming. You didn't need John the Baptist to prepare the road. And, and this, this big one that's coming, well, when he comes... Yeah, we, we rehearse the story every year. He's, he's coming in Bethlehem, born as a baby to Mary. And, and yes, the angels lit up the night sky. The shepherds went to see this thing they were foretold. And yeah, we, that's just the backstory, so that we all might know exactly who this one is that's coming, that he is the very Son of God, the Savior, the King the coming judge. So brace yourselves. This one, Jesus, is coming to us. And when he comes, the heavens will disappear with a roar. And the elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Do you know what that means? It means every word you whispered to somebody. Every deed that you have done will all be exposed and laid out for judgment before Jesus on that day. It's a sobering realization. And we might comfort ourselves for a moment to realize, well, wait a minute, these words were written 2,000 years ago. Perhaps we've got a little margin before it all goes down. And Okay, well, who knows how many more millennia are yet to come, but also know that this delay, however long or short that it is, is all on purpose. It is by God's design. He is patiently waiting so that more and more people will come to repentance and faith will turn from their old way to God's way. Because when he comes, the heavens will be destroyed by fire, the earth will be laid bare, and the judgment. But also know that when this second advent of Jesus arrives, he will bring with him a new heaven and a new earth. You know, we're, not, we're not just going to float around on clouds. We're going to be on terra firma. We're going to be a ground. There, there'll, be, there'll be breezes and flowers and trees. There, there's going to be things to do, people to see. It's going to be with Jesus in charge. We sing that the government will be on his shoulders. In other words, everything will be done according to his way of love and goodness and rightness. No more death. No more wrong. No more evil but only his righteousness. That will be a very good day. But first comes the judgment. And knowing that everything will be exposed in this way and laid bare and this old world will be destroyed, what kind of people ought you to be? That sounds like something you'd hear in church, right? Maybe, you know, what kind of people should you be? You know, you think about that. You go home and you think about that. I suppose you could read this and you could preach that way, but you totally have missed what the text is actually saying. When we are asked what kind of people we are ought to be, it, it, it's asking about our being more than our doing. Certainly, when we are asked this question, it includes your behavior, for it talks about holiness and godliness. But when the question is asked, it's not so that you could check to see if you're on some kind of naughty or nice list with God. It certainly includes your behavior, but goes well beyond into the very depths and core of who you are to the very thing we call your identity. What makes you, you? Now, there has been a lot of focus and discussion lately about our identities. And it's all with the catchphrase of, well, this is who I identify as. And that, even in spite of my biology and gender, I identify this and fiercely 
proclaim it to the world. Now, we may raise our eyebrows at someone who would claim to be something very different that would be on their birth certificate, but then you really have no idea just how powerful your identity that you have really is. Whatever you claim to be, you too fiercely hold on to it. You say to the world, I don't care what you say about me. This is who I am. And the thing about an identity, whatever yours is, it then leads to all kinds of behaviors, feelings, and thoughts. Why, as you look at the power of identity, let's just put some real example to it. Some e uneasy identity to be like a guy. If you're a dude, a guy, you, w w w that's your identity, okay, you know, and, and because I'm a guy, you know, this is kind of the behavior that flows out of it. Why, we guys, we, we don't show our emotions. Oh, well, we might show one, that's anger, you know, but yeah. And, and we, don't, we don't show weaknesses. Come on, we're guys. Yeah. Okay, identity leads to this kind of behavior. You can't get outside of that. That's how strong and powerful it is. Let's, let's try a softer one. You're a mom, right? It's your identity. Well, I'm a mom. Okay, well, what kind of behavior? Well, it's my job to worry about you. You ever said that? Okay. Yeah, because you're a mom, all right? That's, that's who you are. It's what you do. And that's okay. Your identity is powerful. It leads to a very restrictive behavior. You can't get out of that. Otherwise, you're not that. Now, obviously, you can see that there's a great strength in an identity, but there's also a great weakness because it's not just two. You're not just a guy or a mom, but it's like a stack of cards. We have identities after identities. Why, I'm an American. I'm a Kansan. I'm a Wichitan. I'm, I'm, I'm white. I, I'm a professional. I, I'm a dad. I, it's just layer after layer after layer of who you are. And each one of them has this very restrictive behavior and code that you must follow because that's you. And then there's a top card that you pull off and you show to the world when you're feeling like, hey, you don't know who I am. Right here it is. That's me. And we fiercely defend it. But if your top card, say, is a guy, and you, in fact, have indeed failed, then... You're not a real guy. You know, if you show your emotions, come on, man up. You're not a real man. Or if you're a mom and, and your kids are now in college, you can't mother them. And then you have an identity crisis. Well, who am I? And then some of those cards, it's not just that you have a crisis, but you can be awfully mean to people. Why, if your top card is your race, then any other race is inferior. Or if it's your social status or a, a financial status, then anybody above you or below you is despised. That top card's really important because we shuffle and reshuffle all those different identities for the moment, but that top one, it defines us. All the other cards are shaped by that one. Now, while we may be very proud and fiercely defend this top card, here's the news that you may not realize, is that you didn't come up with this. You didn't just look into yourself and say, well, this is what I feel like, this is what I think I am. This identity and the whole stack has been given to you from the outside. Really? Check it. Would you be the same person you are today if you had had different parents? Like, not the nice ones, but the mean ones? Or if you, if you had the nice ones instead of the mean ones? Or if you just had one parent, if you had no parents, wouldn't you be different today? Or if you had different friends? Like at those key moments in your life when you really trusted and relied on that friend who was there for you? But what if that was a different kind of friend who had betrayed you? What if, you know, you had different physical abilities or disabilities? If you were in a wheelchair right now, would that not make you a different kind of person? Or if you'd grown up in a different country, if you'd grown up in poverty or in riches, even your personality 
whether you're talkative or quiet, it's all been given to you from external sources. Or you're saying, well, what about my DNA? Yeah, that was given to you by your mother and your father. The point is, there are no self-made people. You are a collection of all these outside influences, gifts, abilities, accidents, things that have happened to you. So when we ask the question, what kind of people ought you to be? It's to pull up that top card, the one you think you are, your identity, and take a good look at it and ask, is that top card a Jesus identity or is it some other card? Because only a Jesus identity has the strength to deal with all of the weaknesses of our other identities. So that if you're identifying as a certain, well, th this, is, this is my profession, and, and we really do that. Like, you know, I'm a pastor, okay, so that's who I am. But if you're not pastoring, if you're not engineering, if you're not teaching, if you're not doing your normal job, are you really that? Jesus is the only top card that says, no, you have an identity that cannot be changed, that cannot be taken, and it, it all forms in from this top card. And he's the only top card that can give us the grace and the patience for that, the people that are different, the people that, that we would, because of our other identities, look down on. But Jesus there, he gives us the kind of heart and forming where we love other people like we would want to be loved. Where we love God with all of our heart and soul and strength. Where we even love ourselves. Now, the reason that he, he's able to do this is certainly that he is God. You know, God's son, the Savior. But it's more than that. You see, this Jesus not only identified with us, he became one of us. And that's what the first Christmas was all about, that God so identified with us, slipping into our humanity. He was tempted in every way we are, dealt with every weaknesses that you and I deal with. And then he even identified with our sinful nature. Without sinning himself, he took within himself all of our unholiness and our ungodliness that comes from our other identities in the stack of identities we present to the world and there for all of humanity having died for our sins he then creates a new humanity a new identity created in the image of him see he becomes your top card by going into death and rising again and saying I now give to you a new identity and that new identity begins to shape and form all the others, from your preferences to your person, from your characteristics to your uh, desires. Everything about you now shapes and forms into what is holy and godly according to Jesus. So as Peter then goes on to write, he says, Dear friends, since you have this identity, since this is the kind of people that you are, Make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. The key word in this passage from Peter is effort. Because we don't live in a, a neutral environment. From the moment you get up to the moment you go back to sleep, this world is trying to shape and form you into its image, into its likeness, into what it values. And we... Without the effort, if you just go through life and just whatever happens to you happens, then you will look exactly like the world. It takes effort then to examine the world and to avoid those things that would shape you because everything the world is doing says, well, this is normal, this is good, this is right, this is desirable, this is success. Without that effort, you'll just buy right into their top card. But it won't be the Jesus card. With the Jesus card, then, you begin to examine all the things that you look at during the day. Because how you're formed is, some pr is in some pretty simple ways. It's where you spend most of your time. It's the stories that you listen to and the strokes that you get saying you're an awesome person. So if you spend most of your time watching CNN News, guess what you become like? Or Fox News. 
or on Facebook. Did you know that Facebook put the like button on there to shape and form your behavior? Because it gives you a stroke. People like me. I wonder who likes me now. How many people like that picture? <laughs> I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying they did it to manipulate you to form and shape your behavior. Well, knowing with wisdom then that everything in this life is trying to shape and form me, what kind of people ought you to be? The kind of people that look like the world or the top card, Jesus? As, as you go through life, and without the effort of actually being with God's people, you know, you may, you may wonder, well, why do we got to get together for worship? You know, can I just do this at home? You can and you should do it at home. But without spending time being formed with one another, without God working with us together, we actually need to be together on a regular basis because this is how we're formed. We need to be hearing God's story, receiving His meal. We need to be together in prayer and encouraging one another because this, this is reality. This world will pass away and we're waiting for the one who is our top card and our identity. So during this season of Advent, it is a time of preparation, making effort. Some people add to their efforts Advent devotions. And you can go online. I, I sent out um, an online version of, of Advent devotions. It's a time to add ritual, an Advent uh, wreath, having something like this in your home where you're lighting the weeks of Advent spending extra time in, in prayer and God's Word. Not because it's godly or holy or God will get you if you don't, you're on the naughty list. It's because this is what forms you. The Holy Spirit uses this to give you the grace that Jesus won for you at the cross. For you're His. You're His dear people whom He loves. May that identity be fiercely presented to the world. Amen.